young Sherlock Holmes and the Pyramid of Fear. You can read along with me in your book. You'll know it's time to turn the page when you hear this. Let's begin now. I was 16 when I arrived at my new boarding school in the heart of London at the height of the Victorian era. Nothing could have prepared me for the extraordinary adventure that lay ahead, nor for the extraordinary individual who would change my life. The sound of a violin assailed my ears as I entered the hall where the older boys spent their free time. The playing stopped and I saw a tall, thin boy of my own age about to throw the violin through the window. Stop! Don't do that! I should have mastered the damn thing by now. I've been playing it for three days. But maybe you're right. So, you're the new boy. Tell me about yourself. No, wait. Your name is James Watson. You're from the north of England. Your hobby is writing. Your father is a doctor, and you have a particular fondness for custard tarts. My name's John. Otherwise, you're perfectly right. How do you do it? Pure and simple deduction. Your name tag is marked J. Watson. John would have been my second guess. Your style of shoes I've seen only once before, in the North. That callus on your finger is the trademark of a writer. You carry a book available only to practicing physicians. Since you obviously haven't been to medical school, I knew that it was given to you by someone concerned for your health. Your father, the doctor. Amazing! What about the custard tart? Simple. Your lapel is stained with custard. And your shape convinced me that you've eaten many of them. I was not amused. What's your name, anyway? Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Holmes showed me round the school, and much to my surprise, I saw a girl. Holmes explained. Her name's Elizabeth. Her uncle and guardian is a retired master. She lives with him, here at the school. Elizabeth's uncle, Wax Flatter, by name, was an inventor. I saw him on the roof with an extraordinary flying machine. He launched himself from the top of the building, but crashed. Fortunately, into a snowdrift. Failed again. But I'll succeed eventually. Watching Holmes fence in the gymnasium with the headmaster, Mr. Wraith, I noticed a dark-haired woman. I asked Elizabeth who she was. This is Chris. Ray's secretary and assistant. His constant companion. Rafe won the bout at last, but he obviously thought highly of Holmes. Well played, Holmes, but don't let your emotions take control. Holmes's favourite occupation was deduction, and two newspaper reports of sudden death, which he noticed in Wax Flatter's laboratory, led him to visit Detective Sergeant Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Lestrade sighed. Yeah. Holmes, please. I don't have time for any more of your playpen crimes. Look at these newspaper clippings. So? A suicide and a carriage accident? I suspect foul play. Both men graduated from the same university in 1809, and neither of their deaths fit their personalities. Lestrade was not impressed. If you want my advice, keep your nose out of the times and into your school books. Shortly afterwards, Holmes was falsely accused of cheating, and although Wraith stood by him, the school board considered his excellent record further proof of his dishonesty, and he was expelled. As we said goodbye in the street outside the school, 
I noticed Holmes looking at an upper window. Elizabeth gazed down at him and traced a message on the frosted pane. I love you. Then we heard a scream. A cloaked figure rushed past me and dropped a kind of blowpipe. Holmes put it in his pocket. A man lay sprawled on the pavement. It was wax flatter. Lestrade arrived and listened to an antique dealer explaining what had happened. He came into my shop and suddenly got this wild look in his eyes. He went crazy. He snatched up a knife and stabbed himself. We knelt beside Wax Flatter, who tried to speak. <laughs> With that, he died. Holmes approached the detective. Lestrade, this concerns what we talked about. Please listen to me. Lestrade ignored him. Get those schoolboys away from here! Elizabeth was allowed to stay on at the school, and on the night of Wax Flatter's funeral, she and I sat miserably in his laboratory. Suddenly, Holmes appeared from the fire escape. I'm convinced that Wax Flatter was murdered, and that his death is connected with the two men that I talked to Lestrade about. I'm going to find out the truth, Watson. I'll live here secretly. You can be my assistant. But we've only two clues, Holmes. Wax Flatter's final words, A tar, and the blowpipe dropped in the street. When we find its owner, Watson, we'll find our murderer. The next day, Holmes and I showed the blowpipe to a curio dealer. There's an Egyptian tavern keeper who'd know about that. We made our way to the tavern, where the Egyptian leered at us. What can I get you to drink, young gentleman? Have you got any cocoa? Don't be foolish, Watson. Now, what can you tell us about this blowpipe? The Egyptian went pale. Lame tap. Get out, or these words will be the last you'll ever hear. Back at school, Holmes went straight to the library and later told Elizabeth and me what he had discovered. Rain Tep, an ancient Egyptian cult. They use a blowpipe to shoot tiny thorns smeared with a drug which induces hallucinations so realistic they drive the victim insane. We must find that cult. I'm certain whoever dropped this blowpipe was a cult member. If we could only trace him. The jingling sound, which I remembered hearing, just as the cloaked figure rushed past me, when Wax Flatter stabbed himself, prompted Elizabeth's memory. I heard something like that one night when my dog Uncas chased someone over the wall. He bit off a piece of his cloak. Holmes was alert. Where is that piece of material? We found it after a long search, and Holmes examined it meticulously. It bears traces of paraffin, manufactured exclusively by a firm who have their warehouse in Wapping. Come on! The game's afoot! When the music finishes, turn your cassette over.
We soon reached the rotting warehouse by the river and went inside. Suddenly the floor gave way, and we slid down, down, down to the foot of an enormous wooden pyramid. Holmes discovered an entrance into it, and we crept through. We were inside the head of an enormous idol, looking through its eyes down into a bizarre Egyptian temple. Rain Tep followers were bandaging a girl like a mummy. Their leader wore an animal mask and towered over her. He gave a signal and she was engulfed in a river of embalming fluid. Stop! She's still alive! We were discovered. We fled out of the warehouse into a graveyard, pursued by the cult who blew poisoned thorns at us. Elizabeth and I were hit. She began to hallucinate. It's going to bury me alive. Help me, Holmes! Elizabeth, don't believe it. It's not real. Then I began to hallucinate. An army of cream cakes came to life and tried to force themselves down my throat. Dreadful. A cult member ran at Holmes with his sword. All seemed lost when a shot rang out. The swordsman fled. We were saved by the cemetery caretaker. The strayed still refused to listen to Holmes. Then I'll leave you these thorns I grabbed from one of the rain tap. I suggest you test them. Lestrade swept them aside contemptuously. Ouch! Back in Wax Flatter's laboratory, I found a painting of him with a group of men, which impressed Holmes. Good show, Watson. All but one of them have died strangely in the past few months. Then the door opened, and we were discovered by Mr. Wraith. You are trespassing, Holmes. But I'm willing to forget about it if you go home as planned. You too, Watson. And Elizabeth, we will find a place for you elsewhere. Tomorrow, all three of you will go. Elizabeth was put in Mrs. Dribb's room for the night, but Holmes and I managed to reach her by climbing along the window ledges. Holmes gave instructions. There's one man in this painting, Cragwitch, who is still alive. Watson and I will visit him. Elizabeth, you go to the laboratory and collect Waxflatter's important papers, his blueprints and such. Cragwitch greeted us with a blast from a shotgun. But eventually, he told us his story. All of us in the painting were involved in an unfortunate venture in Egypt. We received this letter from a boy whose mother and father had died as a result, saying that he and his sister would use the rain tip to destroy us. The boy's name was Atar. I remembered. Wax flatters final words. Holmes pointed to the letter. What's that design? The couch symbol. It looks familiar. Cragwitch complained of an insect bite on the neck, but he had been struck by a thorn. <sighs> he began to scream and grabbed Holmes by the throat. Help, Watson! He's strangling me! I tried to help without success. Then Cragwitch rolled back unconscious. Lestrade stood there, having knocked him cold with the butt of his revolver. I accidentally stuck myself with a thorn. Hallucinations were ghastly. It took four policemen to stop me hanging myself. So I looked into your story, Holmes, and decided to come and question Mr. Cragwitch. Now I want you and your 
podgy little friend out of here. Trudging through the snow, Holmes recollected the rain tip design. How could I be so stupid? We must get back to the school. As we reached the school, we saw a carriage drawn by galloping horses bearing Wraith and Mrs. Dribb, with a hypnotized Elizabeth between them. Mrs. Dribb's hair looked like that of a member of the Rain Tep. I didn't understand. Holmes explained. Wraith is a tar. The design on that letter was the same as his ring. He is the leader of Rain Tep, and Mrs. Dribb is his sister and the cloaked assassin. The carriage was soon out of sight, but Holmes led me onto the school roof, where was hidden the latest version of Wax Flatter's flying machine. Holmes boarded it, and full of trepidation, I joined him. Pedalling hard, Holmes launched the machine over the streets of London. It works! Beneath us, Wraith's carriage stopped outside the cult headquarters, and Elizabeth was dragged inside. Holmes landed the machine on the frozen river and we chased after them. Wearing the robes of the cult leader, Wraith was about to sacrifice Elizabeth, who was being bandaged, just as the other poor girl had been. What can we do, Holmes? Quiet, Watson. I must think. I have it. The geometry of this pyramid is such that if I dislodge one beam, the whole thing will collapse. He set a large chandelier swinging. Oh, it crashed down and brought the rest of the pyramid with it. Holmes attempted to rescue Elizabeth, but was laid low by Wraith who seized her and made his escape. The warehouse began to blaze and the cult members were crushed or burned. From my vantage point in the head of the idol, I could see Holmes lying unconscious on the chandelier and through a window, Wraith about to take Elizabeth off in his carriage. I managed to throw the chain which supported the chandelier so that it caught onto the axle of Wraith's carriage. As the vehicle drove away, it raised the chandelier with Holmes upon it. Holmes recovered. Good show, Watson. The chain tightened, overturning the cabin. Wraith ran off on foot with Holmes and me in pursuit. We caught up with Elizabeth as Wraith turned and fired at Holmes. <coughs> Elizabeth was in the way. She fell, badly wounded. Holmes chased Wraith onto the ice, and they began a desperate sword fight. Then the ice beneath Wraith gave way, and he sank into the freezing water. Holmes sped back to where Elizabeth lay across my lap. She smiled at him. I... Wait... For you... Holmes looked down at her. She was dead. I shall always live alone. And so the case was solved. Although Lestrade claimed all the credit and was promoted to inspector. I said goodbye to Holmes, little dreaming that one day our paths would cross again. <laughs>